Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Do you suffer from dry, chapped audio? Audio that's drier than your mouth the morning after a night on the tiles with a packet of Jacob's crackers for breakfast while camping in the Gobi Desert. You, my friend, need to moisten your signals with... Signal sounds are purveyors of hardware wetness of all shapes, sizes and diffusions. This includes the absolutely extraordinary Eventide Space, Eclipse and the mighty H9000. They also do the darling Otto Boom, Mylar Melody's favourite herb verb, Eurorack module. They also do deep cuts like the Earthquaker Afterneath, which sounds like reverb falling apart in four dimensions. But best of all, they also do a little thing called the Tip Top ZDSP Eurorack module and the Halls of Valhalla and Shimmer cartridges from a little company called Valhalla Dusp. Visit Signal Sounds and your signals will be wetter than an otter's bucket after two weeks at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Visit SignalSounds.com. That website is SignalSounds.com. Welcome, friend. I hope you like reverb. Today we are going to talk about reverb. No, not the retail outlet, the tool. Yes, Why We Bleep is obviously about talking to electronic musicians and equipment makers, but that also includes the makers of effects. Everyone loves an effect. I know I do. I've probably abused reverb more than any other effect in the world. I really can't take enough of it. I love reverberation. And there's just something about a good reverb, a really luscious, gorgeous reverb. You might be a person wondering, what is reverb? What does that mean? Well, reverb, of course, is the sound of spaces. And that's a mistake, because what we're going to discover today is it's not really about the sound of spaces, good reverb design, because reverbs are designed, is about non-real spaces that appear real in most cases. And so the man that we're going to meet today is called Sean Costello. And Sean is the brain behind a company called Valhalla DSP. Sean has been around for a long time and Sean has built up his own mini empire of plugins primarily although he does also make the Valhalla halls of Valhalla cartridges which go in the tip top ZDSP uh, which we mentioned during the advertisement which I have not got but is supposed to be amazing but the plugins I have got my goodness gracious all his plugins are $50 each that is not a typo they are 50 bucks and they really truly and I'm not getting paid to say this could cost three to four times as much and still be worth every penny. Like that's actually true. But he's found a sort of almost kind of iPhone level of payment, you know, where he just makes his plugins a price that no one can argue with and doesn't require artist discounts or anything like that. It's just, you've got no excuse. You should just buy them. And I, absolutely love his plugins and the reason i love his plugins is the tone the sound there is a kind of rich gorgeousness to his plugins which is just what you want when you put on an effect you want it to just make your signals sound gorgeous and better and that's what his plugins do for me they're really easy to use although we'll talk about the ones that are perhaps not as easy to use as they could be and so I've, I've loved them. And I've also, when I've seen Sean kind of talk in um, like online talks and stuff, he's a very, it's readily apparent how passionate he is about the whole thing of reverb and effects. He's a deeply knowledgeable person, but he's also deeply passionate about it. It is his life's work. And so today is going to be an absolutely no holds barred nerd chat about the inner workings of reverberation 
primarily. Although we do also talk about Delay, and we also talk about his love of Moog synthesizers. So today is going to be nerdy. I hope you're wearing a seatbelt, and I hope you're interested to crack open the grimoire of reverb, as Sean calls it, because you're going to get a peek behind the curtains at some of the just astonishing kind of knowledge of the people, some of these wacky concepts, some of how these things actually work. I found this deeply fascinating, and I hope that you will too. Um, if I think if you're, you know, you're listening to Why We Bleep Still, then you can appreciate the, the nerdy side of understanding technology and these tools that we love. You know, this is going to be a peak behind the curtain. So we'll talk more afterwards. But before we speak to Sean, we have just one more sponsored message. Why We Bleep is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people like you. Offering thousands of inspiring video-based classes on a multitudinous array of topics from illustration to graphic design, music production, animation, film, writing, you name it, they've probably got it. I have been planning a new music project, so I was incredibly intrigued to see Learn How to Mix Music with Young Guru, Grammy-nominated audio engineer and really good teacher. Young Guru teaches the basics of mixing, a process which I am still not particularly confident on, and in it lays out a completely systematic method for mixing, from organising mixes to basics of EQ, balancing, and really, really good explanations of compression. It is absolutely clear that Young Guru has taught this stuff many, many times over. Is He just has such a clear, lucid, solid way of explaining things. He's really good. So it's just absolutely brilliantly delivered solid stuff. And even if you think you're pretty hot on something, we could all do with a little refresher now and then. So if you're curious to try Skillshare for yourself, by the way, it is extremely affordable at less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. However, the first 1,000 people who click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. So, when you're done with the pod, click the link in the description and learn yourself some new skills. And I do believe with that, it is now time. Sit down, stand up, and indeed, strap in. We're about to meet Sean Costello of Valhalla Dusp. Thanks. <laughs> I suppose I don't know how it works in terms of the life cycle of your products. Like, do they do your products endure for years, or do they do they have a strong start and tail off? Or I personally would feel surely they stay relatively stable. Now, obviously, after an initial spike, they've actually grown for the most part over the years. Like, I mean, it depends on the product. I mean, like you know, and that's something I've learned. It's like there's been a lot of learning about like what makes for a good product. And a lot of that is different. Like a product is different than like the, the expression that really, I really came to mind over the last several years is kill your darlings. I forget who came up with that, but it's the idea is like, okay, you have like characters in your novel and you love this one character. And it's like, it's the best. It's like, does that ca character actually carry the story forward or is it slow stuff down? And the same thing with like, but the difference is like, do these things in this plugin, does it carry stuff forward or does it slow stuff down with the caveat that what we're finding more and more is that just as we get information overload, that the most valuable commodity anyone has, I mean, not anyone has, but a lot of people have is time. And if you've got uh, millions of controls on your thing, yes, you can dial in whatever you want, but are they necessary for like 95 or 99% of the people that use that? And is that just slowing people down to have to look at that and process that? And that's something I've definitely had in my products. And fortunately, this is something is like, you know, I could like sit there and theorize all about this. We have like a survey that we had running for four years where I asked people about this and, you know, gave away a free plugin as part of this survey, which 
to any other plugin developers out there, it's a really good idea to do that because you can learn so much from people by asking them questions. And like, you know, this is for like paying customers, like had people answer the survey and it was really learned a lot. And like what I found is that people don't want the most complicated things in the world. And then the other thing is that sales reflect it. And I know that like my most complicated plugin as far as parameters is my lowest selling considerably even though it's also one of my most, like the people that love it, love it. Are we talking about R- Room? No, we're talking about Ubermod. Ubermod, right. I was going to say, because Room is, of your reverbs, room, room is the one for me. And I must say, I've basically never touched the controls on the right-hand <laughs> side of that plugin. I don't, I don't know what they do. I don't know what they do. I don't, and there are pages of them as well, which blows my mind. I don't think I've ever clicked on the second page. I've, I, but I love that plugin and I use exclusively the left-hand side of it. And yes, which begs the question, should the plugin have just been the left-hand side and a bunch more modes that kind of fold in and stuff? Or, I mean, like my current thing is that in order to get like minimalism is really important to those of us at Valhalla, you know, me, Kristen, Don. Yeah. Um, but, but minimalism is like, what I'm finding is that minimalism is something that needs to come from the algorithm itself. Not saying that the algorithm has to be minimal under the hood. They aren't. But can you have an algorithm that works with minimalism? For example, like all my reverbs have diffusion control or controls, and which is great. It allows you like part of the idea of the diffusion control, especially in older digital reverbs, is that diffusion is basically echo density, the initial echo density. And the idea being that it's like the way that they would get echo density in older reverbs was through certain techniques and like usually like having a several all pass delays in series. Like the idea is like, okay, by like changing the parameters of those all pass delays, you can have less diffusion or more, but more diffusion results in a more metallic sound. But it works. So for example, you might want more diffusion for a snare drum and where the metallic sound is fine, yeah. But you, but you'd have less diffusion for vocals, and that's but which is great that you've got that power. But that's also kind of putting your technical limitations and kind of throwing up your hands and giving it to the end user and say you get to decide what this is. It's like whereas like a real room, there's no diffusion parameter. You go into a real room and it's diffuse. It's just, it's and like a well, like a good room instantly is diffuse. It doesn't sound metallic. It sounds beautiful. It's got the right amount of echo density. It's just, it works. And so you can make a plugin that doesn't have a reverb plugin that doesn't have a diffusion parameter. All you need to do is come up with an algorithm that doesn't, that sounds good without adjusting these diff- all pass gains. So it doesn't need to have adjustable diffusion. But so that's like, for me, that's what's pushing like kind of the future direction is like, how do I come up with algorithms that work with more minimal UIs? Like, and, you know, for example, like compressors, which I'm not that good at, but <laughs> I'm at de- a designing. But like, if you look at like a compressor, like, uh, I don't know, the LA-2A, mm. what does it have? Like two knobs, four? Two knobs. And one is volume. It has two Yes, knobs. exactly. And a switch. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, which I've, I never touch. The LA-2A is, but I, I regularly cite that piece of equipment um, when just when talking to developers and people who make hardware. It's like one of the greatest compressors of all has really only got one significant knob that does anything. Exactly. And what I have noticed that like in online forums and stuff, you get people that want more options and those people tend to talk more. <laughs> loudly so like the 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 words are dominated by ones that want more the sales i've noticed are like they don't want more parameters like i mean for example i was uber mod is like i really did love that plugin i was like i just gotten room out it was doing pretty good it's like okay i was excited about this i was drinking tons of coffee (laughs) i was a young spritey 41 years old (laughs) (laughs) and um I'm like, oh, you know what? This is like, I'm kind of basing it on a roll in Dimension D, but it's like, but this has got the thing is like, but what if a Dimension D had up to 32 different voices and had diffusion and you can extend them and multi-tap and reverbs and all that. And it's like, and it's cool. And it has like close to 40 parameters, whereas a Dimension D has one. Yeah. 
has one parameter that's determined by four switches. And yes, you could do a combination of them. So let's call it maybe two parameters. You don't even have a mix. It just does that. And it does that well. And if you don't want that, you use something else, which is like, you know, it's like, and like, and that's something that it's just weird to think about, like, how do you get these things minimal and still have them be usable in something that seems like worth selling in this environment? Because it's like, it'd be hard to like, here's a chorus. It has one knob Buy this. It's like, as a plugin, people might look askance at that, even though in hardware, that's absolutely what people might go for. Waves did that with the whole one knob thing, which I and I remember looking at that, and I and I'm I'm at this, you know, I looked at it and was like, "Piff, I'm a I'm a <laughs> professional, I know what I'm doing." But yet, yeah, the the LATA has one knob, really one significant knob, and it's the compressor I use the most, so it doesn't apply. And I think. It is interesting what you say, but like with Ubermod, yeah, I mean, I've bought all your plugins individually. I own them all and it's true. Yeah, that one, I I think I thought it was a delay significantly and really it's a modulation plugin. But then, I, you know, I can tell you through actual hardcore use, the modulation plugin of yours that I use the most is Space Modulator, which is the <laughs> one you gave away free for doing the survey <laughs> because it's simple. It sounds great and it's just, and there's only five knobs really to mess with. And I think that's something is like, I felt freedom doing that. It's like, I know I'm giving this way for the survey. And then, you know, after four years, we went to a new website. The survey was becoming like, there's technical problems. Like, oh, let's just give it away. We're all, we're all stuck indoors. People here, take it. And then, but it's like, but designing that was great. It's like, look, I really want to do something. It's like, you know, you could tell by the knobs, like I like boss pedals. I mean, they're not my favorite pedals, but I like the colors of them. I like pedals. I like, and I also really love like the Boss, like early '80s half rack devices. Yo, oh, god, yeah, yeah, yeah. The RP10 and stuff. Oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a bunch of those, and it's like I didn't want it to sound like those. I don't care about like I've never like. There's no pedal flangers. I've gone, hey, this is great. Like for the most part, pedal flangers are not my favorite sound. I I will say I don't own an electric mistress, probably should someday. But it's just like, let's just do something that's simple. How many controls does a flanger really need? Because it's like I've gone through that exercise of like, what if a what if a chorus had 35 controls? It's like eh, maybe that which is great, but it's like that's not necessarily what people want. And another example is like my my one little pinky toe into the Eurorack space was releasing cartridges for the tip top zdsp i've just realized yeah sorry and while i've got you on the phone sean when are you releasing a goddamn goddamn module put it in a module money is on the table why is it why for me i don't use euro rack that much i found that i am like when it comes right down to it i do not dream of wires and that's really not it's not because of the music but it's because a reverb is like a reverb is something that makes like uh like uh what the heck is this name? <laughs> Who's the person that you see screenshots of the most complicated patches on a regular basis? Uh well Richard Devine. A reverb makes a Richard Devine spit patch look like a 303. Yeah. It really does. It's like a reverb, but I mean it's a bunch so much parallelism that I think that it's like that's where my mind goes for that for my job, that it doesn't go there for fun. And what I do like, though, I do like a good, I like a powerful like synth that's been like wired together. Like, for example, I got a full size ARP Odyssey last year sometime. Mm. And that thing is like for having like, it's so powerful what you can do with it just with this, the sliders and switches. It's really surprising the architecture of that. But then the grandmother and matriarch from Moog are just semi-normal, semi-normalized modulars. I love those so much because you can sit there and do your bread and butter patches without any patching, but put in a couple of patch cords and you can get amazing stuff. Like there's there's this one sound I like, ver- like I had a modular setup where it's like, okay, I've got basically a three oscillator, three VCO patch going through a CP3 type uh, mixer for distortion and... You know, it goes through and it's like it was based around uh, Mother 32 plus other oscillators. It's like 11 patch chords. Same thing on the Grandmother 2 patch chords. Yeah. And for me, it's just like it's easier than I can concentrate more on the music. But that's because, like, for example, like a reverb design, like, okay, let's say that you have a, a delay module. 
And then you route the feedback around through a mixer and then patch it into a mixer and then patch that mixer back into the input. Now imagine that you have four parallel delays and you have that same thing. Now imagine that you have a four by four matrix mixer and you have to set all those knobs to different things. So each, each uh, delay is routes its feedback back into the other four. That is the simplest algorithm in Supermassive, Lyra. So is that how reverbs work? They're sort of self-patched delays. Exactly. But they, and like, you know, and you might have filters in there and stuff. And that's like, I'm describing the simplest one on there. Like the most complicated one on there, Gemini, you might have, you would have, you know, not might, you have 16 of those delays, each one patched into a 16 by 16 matrix. So each delay can receive input from 16 of the, all, all 16 of them. And that's controlled by that uh, density control in there. Supermassive is far simpler than any of my commercial, re- any of the ones that are paid reverbs. Uh, and then another thing, like an- another algorithm in Supermassive, imagine that you have 16 delays, but each one you patch, it's, in, you know, you have a, a mixer where you patch the output back into the input, but then you also have like the input bypassed for the output in this weird kind of feedback feed forward con- configuration. And then you have eight of those in series. And then you have two channels of that. So, and that would be like, that's another algorithm inside of Supermassive. Like an all pass delay basically is a delay line that has both feedback around it and then a feed forward with a certain, like certain gain ratios. And you have to make sure the order of operations and all that. So these things get very complicated very quickly. And that's part of it too. So like imagine that in the modular environment and what a huge nested mess that would be. Well, but I suppose you're not going to create these algorithms from constituent parts, but I guess what I mean is from a from a business perspective. I mean, if there was a Valhalla DSP Eurorack module that just ran ran the you know, ran halls of Valhalla on a piece of dedicated hardware that didn't necessarily require a ZDSP, then that, you know, people would buy that. There's an, and, you know, if you did a version of that that was in a 19 inch rack or a desktop <laughs> box, I'm sure people would buy it too. Cause, or a, a desktop box, I think is called a guitar pedal. I believe that's what they're called. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's like, I, 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 I've thought about that for sure, before, for sure. Now, one thing is that like, I do love the chip that's used in the ZDSP. It's like, it's called the spin semiconductor FV1 and tons of people use it in the Eurorack space and really in the pedal space. It's just taken off massively. The only problems of it is that it's really not copy protected. Right. People can just peel the ROM off and read it. And it's like, uh, there's, so it's like, there's only so much stuff I want to do in there. And two, it's like, you can barely do good stuff with it. And what, and, right. and I enjoy that challenge. It's just like the same as like, you know, like it also has only room for three parameters, which when I first was working with it, it's like, how am I going to do a reverb with three parameters? And then by the time I was done, it's like, I don't really need tone Two would be fine. But <laughs> I mean, like, and I, I, which I think is a ch- like, I love these reverbs. Like, for example, like, I don't know how much you've worked with pedals, but Strymon has this pedal called the Flint or called Flint, not the Flint. So like, you know, tons of people use the big sky, the night sky is very popular, but I, but the Flint is more of like a guitarist reverb. It has like a three knob reverb on it and then like tremolo built in. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like simulating the, what you'd get in a Fender reverb amp from, you know, like, like Fender super reverb or deluxe reverb. It has a pretty good spring model for the, the reverb. It has the one that's supposed to be an EMT 250. And it's like, eh, it's not that good. And then it has one called 80s Hall. And it's just glorious. And it just sounds perfect, especially for guitar, but it works well for synth. It's just a perfect, like glorious, like modulated, not too long of a decay, but you have no control over the modulation. It just, it's like, here's the modulation. It just works. It's like the perfect amount. And that reverb has mix, tone, decay, only controls. Yeah. And it's just I mean, that because someone at Strymon has just spent forever dialing down the algorithm to what just sounds good in the most cases. Is that, or is there more to it? I think, I think that's really it. It's just like they made, and they made the choices. And it's like, also the choices is like, personally for me, like the spring sounds pretty good. The 
middle the 70s emt one sounds horrible to me and then but like the but but that's all just like we're all subjective taste and that 80s hall is like oh this is the one i like i would put that up against any pedal reverb it's like listen to this guys this is so good and i think that i mean like i'm also excited like even though i have like the eventide space and i really don't need to get another reverb pedal but i'm interested in their black hole pedal yeah because that's just like an interesting idea. It's like, that's, again, it's like, look, this is not there. You can see them really trying to simplify what they do. Yeah. Like, how do we have something that's like simplify and then kind of taking away options, which sounds, again, sounds weird. But when you take away options, it also allows like, you know, easier to understand, like just, I mean, like, for example, like the, the Mother 32 demo videos, I love those. And how many of those had a space strapped on? Every single one. Exactly. <laughs> Every one, of course. And when I did them, I made sure to have an even time. Yeah, it's like, and like, and like, because they had like, you know, they, I mean, I think they were like, how many of them were running the black hole preset? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like dual verb. I've used dual verb a little bit more recently, but actually I hardly use black hole in this space. I must say hall, a hall in the space is my favorite. I love the hall. It's just... Maybe in a weird way, it's like I use a Valhalla Room the most. There's just something about when you whack Decay up to sort of 20 seconds on that, it just gives you that big, like, lush hugeness that you're like, ah, like I've gone into a canyon and I've screamed and it's the best sound has just returned to me. And it's, and it's so interesting how much of that is like set, like sensitive to different things. And it's like, and how things like, you know, for example, like I, I know that it's like, you know, the Valhalla vintage verb, like the hall algorithms in there, the concert hall, dirty hall, all those are all based on like the 224 hall algorithm with different differences, which is like the classic algorithm for synths. Yeah. And yet the other day when I like was, playing around like I got the new Prophet 10 and I like play this really low note. I'm like, oh, that sounds so bad. And I look, it's like, I've got vintage verb on the concert hall. It's like, wow, that's so weird because I know I can make that sound really good with the right synth sound, but with this really low sound, it's like, that's not what you want through there. Yeah. At least with the default settings. So it's just, it's just like, there's so many of these things that are like specific, but then there is like the kind of, overarching goal like why i keep working on stuff it's like can at some point you make something that just sounds good on anything if you go into a real cathedral i'm sure that if you played a synth through a big amp in there it would sound good yeah yeah i actually i remember and something i've quoted before but uh, in a talk with another dsp engineer uh, tom herb um i asked tom herb have you played with the herb verb by the way on you know the mate oh, it's i i I've not played with it much. I've um, I've certainly heard it, and I've also like I've read his uh, talk through on the stuff. It was interesting. I like I think at some point I sent him the Gerzon papers that he talks about because those were very hard to find, and I had copies of those that somehow made my way to me from uh, Christopher Moore from Ursa Major, which right. is really wow. strange. It's like you can see like Christopher Moore's notations on those papers. <laughs> no, that's nice well i mean I, i'm bringing it up because he always he told me in person he was like that i know when and so i was like when do you know it's done and when do you know also specifically that you've got the controls you know it's it's how many controls are the right amount of controls and what is the correct range and influence for each one of those and he said it's done when i have lost track of time while i've been <laughs> testing it and I, when i've just I've been looking at my watch and I'm like, holy shit, it's way past lunch and I should be doing something else. It's, it's, it's that. When, I, when I'm in a flow state is what he's getting to. It's when, when I'm in a flow state adjusting parameters and I'm, I'm in a flow state because I'm receiving positive feedback, I suppose, is the implication, isn't it? It's, you're getting good, good information back. I mean, it's, that is not a trivial process by any stretch. And I've noticed with make noise stuff is well calibrated in that, you know, the, the ranges also mutable instrument stuff as an example in Eurorack, all of the ranges of all of the knobs are exquisitely perfect. And I can, I know which one to turn to get a certain reaction. And it's that I can only imagine is an astonishingly, it can only be done through hard work. It can only be done through testing. Well, it's also something like it's part of it is knowing that you need to do it. I think like I, there's like, I, I was working with this uh, 
student who just graduated from UW and like help him out. He's like working on like learning how to like doing plugins. And it's interesting that it's like, okay, it's like, you know, like the stuff that like you're working with juice juice has like wonderful GUI stuff, but it doesn't juice doesn't know what mappings work for a certain thing. If that makes sense. And like, and that's the whole thing is like the mapping of a knob. It's like, you know, it's, it's very much like in digital is like, this is under your control. What this knob does, what not, what numbers, even low level level map to what are really important. And the feel of that knob, even though it's still, you know, feel it's a mouse, it's flat, it's on a screen, but mm. just like what you're mapping stuff to makes such a difference. And it's like, you could just map numbers linearly. And then everything is like your low frequencies have way too much attention or no, not enough attention. And the high frequencies where you don't use it don't have nearly enough. You could do exponential, but then you might have the opposite. Like you're spending far too much time in the low frequencies. I remember for plate, that was the first time I developed this multi-point interpolated breakpoint just for the reverb control. Because it's like, I want this, I want most of the time spent here, this amount of time spent here, this amount of time spent here, and was able to like map those decisions to how the knob felt uh-huh. as you turned it yeah. around and stuff like that. So it's, it's really important to like, especially because part of it digitally, you, you don't have the limitations that hardware used to, for example, I've got a couple of echo plexes here and it's like those, those go between 70 milliseconds and 700 milliseconds and they do so linearly. So it's really easy to get, you know, sweep through stuff and get the delay you want. Valhalla delay goes from one millisecond to 20,000 milliseconds. And there's no way that that mapping that you use for an echoplex or for a space echo is going to work there. So it's like, okay, what range here do I want this to be a space echo? Especially because it's like, I mean, I remember that was the thing too, it's like working with the RE201. It's like, I want to duplicate the artifacts of a space echo, but I'm taking this thing well beyond where a space echo would go. So what do I do once I get outside of that range? Because a space echo, the slower the motor speed, the darker it gets, and the more like slower and deeper the warbles are. But that's at like 550 milliseconds. If I want to do a 15 second loop, if you kept mapping that range, like the way the space echo does, it, you'd have like a one kilohertz cutoff or something. You wouldn't be able to hear anything. And same with like bucket brigade delays, where it's like, you know, you'd have like no bandwidth whatsoever once you get long. So it's like, you kind of have to map this range, but then figure out where you stop mapping the range and what happens there. And it becomes this like you're constructing an imaginary phys- hardware informed thing. It's not hardware, it's hardware informed. There's this guy that I've studied with some like in college called Perry Cook, and he did a lot of physical modeling. Physical modeling nowadays, it's like there really is like, you know, they talk about East Coast, West Coast. There really is a division between the stuff on the West Coast of the U.S. and then the stuff that comes out of Europe. And the West Coast of the U.S. was very much about like, they talk about waveguides versus like Europe is modal stuff. But really, waveguides are just cheating. It's like, how do you do stuff as computationally efficiently as possible? And Perry Cook had this idea, talked about physically informed sound modeling versus physical modeling, which is like you're really mapping every part of the component. Physically informed is like, you understand enough of the physics that you can start construct kind of a model, but then you're changing it depending on how you make it sound the way you want. And I really like, I feel like my stuff is more informed modeling than the model, if that makes sense. Because you're not doing, when you're not like in Valhalla Delay, it's not running the circuit of an RE201 like a UA plugin is doing a circuit model. Well, yeah. And then it's like, you know, UA plugins, it's like, I've, I've worked with them before, like, especially their older stuff was not necessarily running a circuit model. They would do things. It's like, you know, they, like they, they had their own cheats and stuff like that, that they would do because they had to. Yeah. Nowadays, I think that's less of the case. They can start running much more detailed models. Sharks are more powerful than the chromatic chips that they used before. And they can use they just made the decision we can use more of the sharks and people can buy more of these sharks if they need to run more because this is what people demand you know want from the models can you answer the question of like everyone sort of would say you know hey what's the purpose of what why would i buy ua plugins because like a shark processor is like puny compared to an intel processor could you sort of speak to the available dsp to to you developing for kind of intel pl- native 
versus say if you were magically developing like a UA plugin or, or you know or working on a hardware platform. I could I could tell you why you're buying a UA plugin. It's because of Jonathan Abel, David Berners, Tim Stilson, uh, Scott Van Doyne works them there now. Uh, David Jaffe, a bunch of people I don't know the names of. What you're buying when you get a UA and like you know even William Putnam Jr. He yeah. dropped. He dropped out of the grad program at Stanford, but he was really good at this stuff. Before, like, he was in this graduate program for you know PhD in computer music and like you know the double E side, and then I think he had to stop the grad program because it's you know found out that like you know, he started working with like his dad's circuits and stuff, and that business took over. But I feel like with Universal Audio is what you're what you're getting there is. It's less about the hardware itself, and more about the uh, more about the chefs. The chefs are are brilliant. I like. I mean, because yeah, yeah. I've, I've I've worked with these. Like, uh, one thing is, I actually like in two thousand four, I was working in analog devices, and I remember we drove like working down in San Jose and drove over Highway Seventeen, which is just a great winding, beautiful highway through the roads driving to Santa Cruz. So it's like you drive through these like redwoods to the ocean. I mean, it's not glorious. Yeah. Yeah. And it was raining a ton. I remember the guys driving with, he had like a Subaru that just hugged the road. It was amazing. But, but that was something where it's like, we were working with them and introduced them to the shark. Although I think they knew about the sharks. It's not like, Oh, we did that. It's like, they, they, they knew about us before we started talking with them. So, but, but the, so the shark at the time, and this is 2004, Comparing it to like a Pentium 4, it was ridiculous what the Shark could do. It could do so much more than you could ever do on these Pentium 4s. And I just like, I was working at analog devices through the end of 2006, where our whole team got unceremoniously laid off. And um, a lot of the people actually went to Universal Audio from there, which is great. So I got my first MacBook Pro. And this was like one with the Core 2 Duo. And like, all right, let's see what this can do as far as like, you know, compiling native DSP. And I was stunned by what you could do on native DSP. And I know other people coming from hardware DSP programming had similar experiences. Michael Carnes has talked about that. Michael Carnes was at Lexicon for decades and then formed Exponential Audio. And now like, uh, you know, they were acquired by Isotope. And now I think he's officially retired. He talked about what a stunning thing it was to move to like realize what these Intel processors could do. And this is back in like, you know, the late 2000s and the speed just kept getting more and more. So yeah, for me, it's like, I don't really believe in any speed advantages for hardware DSPs at all. I think that you have power advantages with ARM processors, which is why Apple's doing that. And the, and the ARM processors can like the higher end ones, like the ones used in iPhones and these new computers, and to a lesser degree, like the Raspberry Pi, you can do tons of calculations on those. It's really amazing for, for, for far less power consumption. And then the lower end arms are getting to the point like five bucks, you can do a lot on it. Yeah. But you have to pro but you have to program more. You can't just take your plug in and get it running on a five dollar arm. You have to like work for it. Yeah. And that's like, and then that's something that's like, I haven't worked with like the latest, like uh with the latest arms. I know that there's this um STM32 H7s, those are starting to show up in products. I think I have a uh, a Particle 2, I forget the name, Red Panda, Particle 2 pedal. But I just haven't had the time to work with it. I've been working on the plug-in side. So do you do you have like a kind of DSP sort of headroom that you work to, like natively? Do you say it's not okay for a Valhalla DSP plug-in to consume more than 10% of a sort of, you know, X Intel processor, whichever it may be, or how do you, because could you surely, you know, if you did just eat up the, the Intel, you know, burn someone's computer alive, as it were, could you make something that would sound significantly better? Is, is, is power the limitation or is it the chef? It's the chef, I think. I mean, it depends what you're doing. It's like, you know, there certainly are things where, you know, depending on it. And like the answer to that is really what sort of model you're using. For example, if you've got convolution, it's not even like, oh, you, like you can make convolution kind of like to a certain level of 
complexity. And it's like, okay, you've got as efficient as it's going to be. Maybe you can make it more efficient when you go from like an Intel SSE processor to the ones that have AVX, which is cool. So now you've got it mon- optimized from four-way SIMD, single instruction, multiple data to eight-way SIMD, but then you're going to have to go back to four-way SIMD for the new um, Apple stuff anyway. And, you know, but so you have there like kind of like a platonic ideal of like, look, if it's a convolution and it's like stereo and you have stere- different impulses for like left inputs going left, right, and then right, left, it's like you take that and you can look at the length of your impulse and you can kind of figure out what DSP, the optimal DSP. It's something that has a known thing. Other things, it's like you don't know. It's like, and it's like, and like, like I work pretty much exclusively with algorithmic reverbs, nothing against convolution, just that's that's where I go. And there's some great convolution out there. I do like, I always like to call it Liquid Sonics is just awesome. I mm. love their stuff. Like the, the Liquid Sonics plugins are really good. And I see them like really taking off in the post-production space. But I think that I, you know, like for me, it's more about, I like to, it's like cooking. I like the algorithmic stuff. And one thing that I've run into is that if you have twice as much CPU and you do something that's twice as complicated, it doesn't necessarily sound twice as good. Yeah. It, it may actually sound worse. Back in 2017, I'd been working on delay for a year and I was really frustrated. It was really hard to work on that. I'm like, I need to take a couple of weeks and just do R and D on reverb stuff again and like find out what algorithms, what technique can I come up with that will sound good if you throw more DSP at it? Can you scale up things? And it's like the more you the more you give it, the better it sounds. And I was just like, just sat there and just coded like mad in like this kind of minimal environment. And it's just like, no, 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 yes, no, no. Okay, let's go back to that. Yes. And so like, you know, I did, I actually did find a technique. It's like, whoa, okay, this sounds even like with the same amount of DSP sounds better. And with more DSP, it just keeps getting richer and richer. So I'm excited about that for next year or so. Good. Yeah. I suppose that that leads on to a question, which is, sort of a two-parter, which is what, can you speak to the earliest, your earliest algorithmic reverbs and kind of, it will be interesting to hear you speak a bit about the kind of what, what were people doing back then when they had the least amount of CPU power to make things that sounded good? And therefore, could you talk to what you consider as a, what makes a good sounding reverb? Okay, there's a lot here. Okay, this is this is good. I mean, we're we're gonna we're gonna go back to like nineteen early nineteen sixties, like nineteen sixty itself. Bell Laboratories, I believe that they were in Princeton, New Jersey, and Manfred Schroeder was one of the people working on digital audio at Bell Laboratories. Max Matthews was working there as well. This is where digital audio came from, and. Digital, the idea of like computer music, um, computers being used for music really dates back to that time where it's like, hey, while we're here, what if we can get, you know, a computer to make musical notes or sing Daisy? Hmm. And that's, you know, and, and so Manfred Schroeder did work on developing digital reverbs and the building blocks he came up with, comb filters, del- digital delay lines, all pass filters, and then tone controls really like to this day are what this stuff is based on. But here's how he had to develop stuff. He was working with a mainframe computer. So I'm pretty sure he was using punch cards and he would like, it was a time sharing mainframe computer. And there's presumably some, like he was able to get some audio sample of some recording in there. Who knows how long it was. He would run his program processing that, audio sample, the digital information would be spat out onto a digital tape, probably a couple of days later, he would then have to drive 30 miles up to where the only digital analog converter was. (laughs) And then, (laughs) and then like have that play that digital information tape, put it onto analog audio tape, reel to reel, obviously. And then he could hear what he did. (laughs) So 
So hang on, you're 40 minutes like sending it to John I, Gunn. Is- I, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> complaining about going from two minutes to 45. This was like several days and then like a 60 mile round trip to the one well, the one digital analog converter on the planet maybe it's like it's so ridiculous it's like you know like i mean like you talk about like oh i had to go like 10 miles in the snow every day when i was your age it's like nothing nothing like my little complaints about oh i was like i have to wait longer it's like you know it's like it's so that like the think about the work done and part of that though i mean like and what a genius he was and also how are you really going to be able to get like iterate on algorithms if it takes that long mm. you can't so you'd have to do it all in your mind like playing 40 hyper chess it's exactly and so and like when he published his papers in 1961 1962 he said that you came up to to algorithms the schroeder algorithms are called like are like indistinguishable from a concert hall it's like they really weren't. They really, they sounded like reverb, but even then it's like, I remember hearing a composition that John Chowning did with the same reverb algorithms, you know, also doing FM in 1972. And I'm just like listening in the surround room. It's like, what's, what's the bees? Why is there a ton of bees here? It's like, oh, that was the reverb. It just sounded like a swarm of bees, <laughs> like really bad digital reverb with really weird high index FM just equals B. So, so really what happened is that like the people that designed the earliest commercial digital reverbs, the first thing they had to do, and this would have been like, there's two major people that I know about there. I know there's a few other digital reverbs that came out, but the two ones that really sounded good were Barry Blesser working on the EMT 250 and David Griesinger working on what became the Lexicon 224. And in both cases, they came up, what they started with was developing hardware that they could program. I don't know how they program stuff in the 70s. It's like, did you have a terminal you could type things to? Did you still have punch cards? I'm not sure. It was like, was it like a TRS-80? I don't really understand what they would have mm. used. But they came up with digital processors that they could load up with software and you know, here are the results. They weren't single function things. You could like actually do this. And so the first thing that they did is that they read all the literature and they tried these Schroeder algorithms and were just, Ugh, these are not good. And what do we do to make them good? And so they had to like learn how to make things good, but they had an iterative environment. It wasn't going to be two days and driving 60 miles. It's them working you know, however long it took to compile, and then they could run audio through in real time and listen to the results. So in order to have a good sounding digital reverb, they had to have something that played audio live. And then like they developed techniques that were really amazing, like worked with the same building blocks, but improved on them. One of the things that they did is like, they improved on it is that digital reverbs, like you get what's called resonances, like, like the resonance density you can really look at a, at any reverb, including like a concert hall, you know, a room, anything, as a room full of resonances. These are just like little like each one you can almost look at it as like a single pinged state variable filter. It rings at a sine tone. Yeah. And your average room might have hundreds of thousands of those. Concert hall is like four billion of them. It's just like imagine the space just filled of like tiny little bells. And the, those bells, the resonance density maps, if you're doing a reverb with delay lines, the resonance density maps to the total length of your delays that you have. EMT 250 had 300 milliseconds worth of delays. You're not going to get a good resonance density out of that. It sound, if you just have that reverbs, no matter how cool a structure you get, it's going to sound metallic as all get out. So Barry Blesser figured out if these delays are slowly and smoothly changing their delay lengths, then you get something there that kind of smears out these resonances. You don't hear them as resonances and it gets rid of a lot of the metal in the sound. Mm, Yeah. And then the Lexicon 224 did the same thing, but in a more recursive structure where it's like, I mean, if you, if you don't have modulation on 224, it sounds horrible because the modulation is nested deep inside of it. But if you, turn on that modulation because it's nested so deep inside. It's like this delay inside of it starts getting chorusing. And then that passes chorusing to the delay it's inside of. And then that's inside of another one. And that's inside of a huge network. And that happens like several times in there. And it just creates this beautiful lushness that was originally designed 
how do you get rid of the metallic sound of not having enough memory? But then it just became its own sound, this modulated reverb sound. It's like, this is like, it just sounds huge. It doesn't really sound realistic. It sounds beautifully unrealistic. Yeah, that is that is a fascinating idea that what made them successful is the fact they were unsuccessful. They weren't real rooms. No, and they had to like, they and like, but like what real room has a 70 second echo time? And that's something that the 224 had from the get go. I mean, like you can sit there and bring your instruments into like, you know, the the Great Pyramid or into the, well, you can't bring your instruments to the Taj Mahal. I was going to say that. It's like the album that was famous, the first album that was famous with those long reverbs was some guy sneaking into the Taj Mahal at night. Paul Horn wasn't some guy. So his name is Paul Horn. And with a tape deck and a flute and maybe a soprano saxophone and recording it, like he, he, he basically convinced a security guard, can I just record here? But that's how you had to do that in the 60s. There's no room that had that sort of reverb. But then come 1979, you pay however huge amount of money you do for a Lexicon 224, and you can get like this huge extended sound. Were there records that used that kind of super extended, you know, almost kind of what I consider the synth reverb, you know, like beyond sort of seven seconds or, do you know what I mean? Like who was doing that? Um, as soon as it was available, all sorts of people. Eno was using it in 1980. Yeah. Listen to yeah. um, like uh, Harold Budd and Brian Eno, uh, like what is it called? Plateau of Mirrors or Plateau of Mirror. That one has, I don't know if it's a 250 or a 224, but it's got not that length of reverb going on, but still several extended, long, modulated reverbs. They, as soon as people got their hands on it, they started using it. Obviously, the, you know, like Blade Runner, he supposedly had like Lexicon number two, even though it's like, well, but then, you know, Lexicon came out in 1979, that movie came out in 82. But that's where mm-hmm. you hear like these synths, just people started using it the instant they had it. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, if you're in a studio that had that, and that's the whole thing. I know like Eno talks about, you know, interviews back then, he has very, like, he just talks about how he has a synthy and a mini Moog. That's all he owned. Which, you know, nowadays it's like, those are still really nice. But back then, those are like the cheapest, smallest synths that you could buy, pretty much. He didn't own the reverb necessarily. No, but but his, the point is he was working in nice studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had them. Yeah, they had them. And he knew how to, like, abuse that stuff. So I think that, like, the artifacts of digital reverb started being abused as soon as people were able to get their hands on them. It's interesting, the concept of modulation. And to clarify that, you mean it's the sort of, there's a kind of, if you listen to a reverb tales through a decent, you know, with a decent pair of headphones, you can hear this kind of swirling sound. Is that fair? You know, how would you typify it? That's good swirling. It's, it's a chorusing sound. It's, it's basically, if you slowly and smoothly change the length of a delay, you get Doppler shifts. It's like you're, I mean, you can hear the same thing in the world if you're moving towards a sound source or you're making sound and you're moving towards it. I remember in college, I used to ride my bike around really fast. And like, there'd be times like there's a clock tower that would echo off of the walls of these buildings. And if you're riding at the the right time, you're moving towards the bell and away from the reflection of the bell. And it just created this beautiful chorusing. Same thing with like, if you hear trains, it's like, you know, yeah, the train whistle goes up in pitches. It's getting close to you. And goes down in pitches, it goes away. But if you hear it in a forest, it's also and like or mountains, it's also reflecting off of the trees and the mountains with different Doppler shifts. So you get this like like the pitch spreads out. I mean, that's really what it is. It's like it's the pitch spreads out, which is what you also find in a chorus. <sighs> it's kind of you just blur it instead of having a fixed pitch center. It's like it kind of makes it stochastic. It's like the pitch. Eh, it's somewhere in here. It peaks here. And then there's like, you know, yeah, it kind of got like a little side bands, like a little Gaussian peak forming around it. So instead of just like, here's your pitch, it's like, here's roughly where your pitch is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my question is that then thinking about how you develop an algorithmic reverb is sort of, you obviously, there are, there are historic techniques. There's stuff that they used, you know, way back from the very early days of, of the first computers. And then, I mean, as you say, it's a lot of the modern reverbs or like the techniques are, they seem to be just iterations and more complex versions of those simple techniques. I mean, is there, it, are there more techniques or is it just simply the way that the, the, sh- the recipe for, Hey, this many delays in this particular little like spider's web with this like filter applied, 
And how much is there that you can actually mess with ahead of time or think about ahead of time? Do you know what I mean? Like how many, how many different ways, how truly different can you make them sound? And, and what is, where does the chef'sness, you know, where do you, where does your sort of taste come into that? It's, it's for me, it's all chefness, but it's like, I think like what I like, I can, you know, for example, when I was taking my computer music classes, like, you know, actually like did these ones in 98 and 99, I remember I was working with time stretching. It's like granular time stretching. That was a big thing in C sound at the time. And like, oh, it's so beautiful, the lush sounds and how big they'd get. But I found like, okay, but here's this 1982 paper from Miller Puckett and John Stoutner that takes four delay lines and like matrixes them together and feeds the outputs back to the inputs. And I was able to like, whoa, with this, and I had modulation, I can get a similar sound with just these four delay lines that runs in a fraction of a time. So that really got me on reading every single paper there that's ever been published about reverbs. And so you find it's like, it's like, you know, I talked about the basic Schroeder building blocks, but some of the other big names are Gerzon, Michael Gerzon, British. I know that uh, Tom Herb talked about that when doing the Herb Verb. Mm. He was working at the University of York, I think. I, I believe so. Not far from where I am right now. Oh, nice. So much stuff that like more advanced ways of making the spider's web of delays stem from his work there of like feedback delay networks and all pass delays and nesting all passes inside of other networks and stuff like that. It was just really genius. And then Miller Puckett did work on that academically in the 80s. And what's weird, though, is that a lot of the commercial techniques that most reverbs did were not published at all during the 80s. And I think Lexicon was, it really was David Griesinger that developed those techniques. It's interesting to trace so many people learned this thing. I mean, I'm just going to call, you know, it's called all pass loops. We have several all passes in series, but inside of a bigger feedback loop. What, just for the avoidance of doubt, what is an all pass? I don't know what that is. An all pass delay is a delay. Like, you remember, remember I was talking about those delays that have both feed forward and feedback? It's a very particular thing. It's a delay and that has feedback, but then also has feed forward around it with like the opposite sign coefficient. And you do it in such a way that the frequency response is flat. Meaning it's like if you have a comb filter, a comb filter is called a comb filter because if you look at like the frequency response of it, it looks like a comb. There's all these peaks and valleys. An all-pass filter, if you look at the frequency response, it's flat. And what's important about that, I mean, if you hear it, it doesn't sound flat, which is strange. It sounds just like a comb filter, one on its own. But because it's flat, you can put several of them in series and you get a flat frequency response. It sounds more like a reverb. If you put several comb filters in series, it sounds like metallic hell. But then because you can put them in series and still flat, you can put like those in series and then have a delay and a filter and feedback around that. And it's still, it sounds like a reverb and the echo density, each time it passes through that whole network builds over time. And so that was really, that's a simplified form of what Lexicon was doing in the late seventies up till today. But they really like kind of explored this idea of having all passes embedded inside of a bigger loop structure. And all these people heard that and figured out how to do that. Or they bought a 224 and reverse engineered it, like reverse engineered the code. Because, you know, they weren't thinking about copy protection in 1979. It's Hmm. like, what what are you going to, it's like, back then it's like, oh, if you want to copy protect it, it's like, you need to also build the computer on which it runs, the the digital signal processor. But but even people like, I talked to Keith Barr about this from uh, uh, Alesis and Spin Semiconductor, you know, MXR for that matter. And he talked about how he figured it out by, you know, looking at a 224, running stuff through it, looking on a scope, messing with the controls and figuring out what was going on. You know, I've heard that AMS, when they were developing the RMX 16, that yeah, a 224 made its way there and they were checking it out. And like, you know, it's roughly, I think, how the RMX 16 stuff works is an all pass loop. There's always, you know, the Elisa stuff works that way. Tons of commercial reverbs work that way. If you make a structure that sounds just like it, you can say that's what it's doing, but you never know for sure. It's just like, eh, well, this sounds like it. There you go. I mean, like you can kind of take hints and stuff like that listening, but, but the point is none of that stuff, the all pass loop stuff was not being published in the eighties. It wasn't until the nineties where there's a paper from this guy, Bill Gardner, and then later on in the nineties, John DeToro that talked about these techniques. And it turns out that 
they learned them in the industry. Like Bill Gardner had been working at Kurzweil and they had reverse engineered a 224. Same with the, I think Insonic had done the same thing. Everyone took this 224 and figured out how it worked, but no, no one published it until like the late nineties. And they, you know, even had to say, it's like, well, this is stuff we learned in the industry. And one of them got sued. Well, by Lexicon. Actually, they got sued by Insonic, I think, because they, they, they had been hired by Insonic. they have been working for Insonic for hire and then had like contractual stuff and quit and then moved to California and published this paper. And like Insonic had argued, you did this work for hire. We own it. And it turns out that Pennsylvania law is rules like, no, if you did this work for hire in Pennsylvania, just because you did it for hire, you still own the contents of your brain afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, you hope so. Yeah, so, like, so all this like weird, like, I mean, I think that's one of the things I loved about reverb design is that like there's a lot of stuff that's published, but there's a lot of stuff that's not published or implied or kind of secret stuff and that you kind of have to try to find out. And it's like, I always talk about it as like the grimoire, like this kind of like secret forbidden stuff. And it's like, and which is cool, but like for me, it's like, I wish that there was more discussion of it because it's like, I remember it's like, I had to figure some of this stuff out for like vintage verb and all that. And it's like, which is cool, but it's like, but it's like, if you learn those techniques and you really have to learn them, it's kind of like study them, then you can improve upon them. I think. Yeah. I don't, I don't really believe that it's like that, you know, God's finger came on this earth in 1982 and touched it. And that's like the peak of musical gear. I think stuff absolutely can be improved. And like, or at least, you know, it's like, may it's not improved, but it's like, to my taste, it is. It's like, you know, something where I can work in that space and contribute something that's different than what came before. Yeah. Like of your reverbs then, which is the one that you, which do you gravitate to? Valhalla Delay. Of the reverbs, you go to Valhalla Delay. I, I, because it's like, for me, it's like, I really know how to work that thing as a reverb. It's like, I know it's like, okay, if you have like a 300, 300 second delay, turn the reverb size up to 100% or diffusion up to 100%, turn the coefficient between 70 and 90% and turn up the feedback. That's one sort of reverb. Turn the delay time to 1500 milliseconds and then no feedback and then just play with the all pass coefficient. And then that's more, a second sort of reverb. That one's well, like- Wait, which is all pass coefficient? That's not a marked on the Valhalla delay. I, 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 well, because it's like, this is, this is nerd stuff. I'm not going to be like, now I have to bring it, now I have to bring up the GUI and see what I'm talking about. Yeah. I never taught me like, you know, like, and that's the thing is like, I'd say the diffusion arguably is too nerdy of a concept to have in there, but all pass coefficient. Yeah. All pass coefficient is meaningless, but diffusion, I, is a, I can have a sort of lay person's like, it sounds more spread out and sort of floofy. <laughs> like the whole delay looking at there's diff amount and then size. What that is, is basically I've got like, you know, this is one of my little sneak things. It's like, so Valhalla delay is a stereo delay. So if you have it running as a delay with no diffusion, you have two delay lines in there, mod two modulated delays. Yeah. You turn on the diffusion, you have 34 modulated delays. Oh. I add another 32 in there. Like the size of the control controls how much those delays span in total length because they're all in series versus... The, the length of your delay in total and the diffusion amount is just the coefficient of the all passes. Then I do some modulation tricks in there. Those delays are modulated, but you can't control it. And I have ways to just like, I tried like that Strymon Flint I talked about where it's like, you don't have control over the modulation. It just sounds right. And part of it may, I don't want it to sound like modulation. I don't want to have those weird random pitch shifts. I don't want like, I just want it to sound fuller. So that's the sort of stuff I worked on there, like trying to make that more minimal. And so I tend to work with delay a lot for that. Otherwise, I do work with, um, you know, obviously I'll put on vintage verbs sometimes. Uh, plate a lot because like plate doesn't sound like any of the other ones. It sounds like a plate. Mm. Like I was doing, I was playing around with the Prophet 10 last night and I was going for this very 70s sound. It's like, well, let's just put plate on ascend and turn down the size to make it sound kind of metallic. I tend not to use room. I do use shimmer a lot. It is just so darn electronic yeah. and artificial and like just not subtle at all. And then Ubermod every now, like Ubermod I will use for research stuff because I know the control so well, I can kind of set up stuff like, hmm, if I did this instead of programming it, what if I do this sort of thing here? <laughs> you put so many damn controls, you can literally like test out theories. Exactly. I mean, that is a very interesting idea that delay 
that you use Valhalla Delay as a reverb? Well, because it's like, I mean, because it is like the diffusion is like a reverb. And I, like definitely like, and I felt that like looking at some of the other like plug-in delays out there that had diffusion, it's like you didn't go, to my taste, they didn't go far enough. Well, the, the diffusion I put in there is like, it's really very close to what you have inside of Shimmer. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's about that level of complexity and it's like, but it's like the, the lengths are calculated differently and you've got different controls over it, but it's like, how do I get something that sure you can smear out the delays, but you can really create more of a reverberant thing. And then I'm excited. It's like, you know, like some of the new modes have ducking a mode that will be released um, pretty soon is going to have like the pitch shifting mode with ducking. So you can get like ducking shimmer reverbs, which is neat. Mm. Have you, this is something that I've kind of, retain mild frustration with is there's i've never heard a good simulated spring that sounds like a real spring i mean is that do you think i'm being cruel here because no i have a couple of like modular ones and they sound amazing and i've never heard that same just there's some intangible quality to a real spring reverb that i've not heard simulated I, I, yeah, I could, cause I think that it's non-linear in a way, like these things distort and I'm not sure exactly where they distort. So that makes them harder to capture via convolution. Yeah. You know, cause like things that are like distort, like the convolution ends up giving weird, depending on what sort of convolution impulse you use, you get weird stuff. And that's another thing, like a pet peeve of mine. I think a lot of convolution reverbs are great, but they have horrible ways of capturing the actual like convolution signal itself. You can do beautiful stuff with convolution. I just think they're maybe not capturing the impulses correctly. But um, but yeah, but like springs, I don't know how you would under, other than doing it really quiet and just assuming it's clean. But it's like, having said that, like I've captured spring impulses off of like my 201. They sound great. Yeah. You use them and they sound fantastic. And algorithmic springs are one of those things where if you throw more DSP in it, it will sound better. Yeah. Because they use like really short all passes to get the chirp. Or in that case, it's the, the dwip because it's kind of an upwards chirp. The more you throw at it, the better it will sound. But then there's also like, I think a lot of people focus on getting that and forget this is a reverb because it's like they're modeling this as like a, like a bi-directional delay line or two bi-directional delay lines. Which, you know, each spring is technically a bi-directional delay line. And you've got this dispersion in there, which is like, which causes the, the, the chirp or the dwip, which is like the speed of sound dip is different for different frequencies. Yes, this is why, why I discovered when you throw a rock on an icy lake, it goes, it makes a laser sound. It goes, oh, that's boom. the best, that's the best sound in the world. I love that so much. I mean, it doesn't happen that much around here because it's like, it's not too often the lakes freeze, at least where I live. But when they do, it's like, oh, I just love to throw ice on ice and just listen to that. But, um, but, but the thing is, is that people, I think, focus on that or DSP developers and forget this is a reverb. And these springs that you're modeling, a real spring is going to not be just a perfect bi-directional delay line. It's going to be, a, it turns into a reverb pretty quick. Not just, choo, 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 choo. it's like, it turns into a reverb. And one of, the, one of the reasons I think about that is like, you know, the, I think the AKG spring reverbs. Uh, you mean like the BX20? Yes. I've never seen this. I've never played with one of those, but I've seen, you know, pictures of them. I've, I've got the UAD plugin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm sure like, and like, it's a giant spring. It's one spring and it's like folded in a Z thing. So it's like three feet long, but it's not just that. AKG would do things where they would like take the spring and at certain places they would put a solder blob. Other places they would scrape away at it or put it like etch it away at the spring a little bit wow. with some acid. And what that does is that when the, cause like the, you know, the vibrations going down the spring, when it hits that solder blob or that etched away area, that's a discontinuity. And so some of the sound keeps going forward. Some of the sound reflects back from that towards the beginning. And now the thing is, if you have a bunch of those, like let's say you're in between two of them, like, so the sound goes to like one of them and bounces back. It goes through, hits the second. Some of that's going to go through. Some of it's going to bounce back towards that first discontinuity and just keep building back and forth. So what you do is that you that builds up a more complicated echo pattern. And a more ca complicated echo pattern that builds up over time is a reverb. Yeah. And I think there's like people are un not understanding how crappily built these Accutronics spring tanks are. These are not like precision made in some laboratory. They're like weird 
curled springs. They're springs. They're made like they're going to have like divots in them and crap. They're not like well made. And that's why they sound good. Mm. Is that it's like they they turn into a reverb. So it's like I haven't really heard a DSP one. At some point, I may want to tackle that, but I think I respect the problem well enough <laughs> that yeah, it's yeah. like I, I I don't want to release one unless I really think that I've nailed it. And like and there are similar issues with Valhalla Plate. It's like there's dispersion in those too. And I did my model, and then other people have done totally different models that sound really good too. It's like I love like I think that uh, you know talking to. Chris Santoro at Sound Toys, their little plate, it's algorithmic. I think they might have thrown more at it. It's like their CPU is twice as much as mine. So I think they're throwing more cycles at it, which would help it. And then you have these other ones like the UVI and then is it Physical Audio? Is that a company? I don't know that one. No. They're a British company, but they both did stuff based on modeling a plate as th- as thousands of parallel resonances that are running in real time. And then Arturia did a thing where they did these really crazy, like detailed, um, what, like I forget what you call it, but like uh, differential equations, but basically tens of thousands of physical resonances for their plate reverb. But then they, you know, so they create a model and then they did convolution impulses off of that. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, okay. so they load those in, but it's like, it really is like, there's this guy, Kevin Arcus, who did the algorithmic stuff at um, Arturia. You know, if you read like, you know, like the, you know, he's, he's, he's a genius. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of smart folks out there. Yeah. That's a, that's a clever solution to that problem. Is like model, make your computer sweat really hard and then convolution. Like record. Yeah. And then, and then, but it's like, it's their computer that's sweating really hard. Yours don't. Yeah. They just give you like 17 impulses per plate, you know, like, so your decay time is mapped to those. And which honestly, I mean, that's the same thing for a spring. I, I mean, I think the other part that I haven't done an algorithmic spring reverb is like convolution should be able to carry this very well. Hmm. But it's also, it's like, I, sometimes I think it's about like what my needs are. It's like, I've got the grandmother, the Mo grandmother sitting behind me. Yeah, has such a great, such a great spring reverb. It's like, it doesn't sound like a, a reverb to me. It's, it's, it's that it's the yeah. sound. It kind of can sound like a reverb, but for the most part, it's just, it's a, what it is in that thing. And it sounds so glorious and adds such wonderful woody resonances and weird metallic stuff. It's like, like I, I made a beautiful piano set or like a Celeste sound just by like having a sine wave off, you know, the filter is a sine wave going through that reverb and just sampled it and played it different, you know, as a kind of keys. And it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. So nice. You're, um, I must say for a person who doesn't work for Moog, you've made some of the best Moog demos that I've heard. So my, my compliments to the chef. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I think that's like, part of that was like, I think there is like, I will be upfront. It's like, what is it like to do? you know, something that's kind of like marketing where I have no skin in the game. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I'm yeah. an enthusiast about this, but what is it like to kind of like do this where it's like, I'm not hawking my own thing. This is like, I mean, this is a thing I genuinely really do love. That grandmother just was the most inspirational thing, but it's like, eh, let's see what happens if I push it a little bit. It's, it was really great. And I really do love the sound of that synth so much it's the I'm, really... I'm totally with you as well and not just because i do actually work for moog in the <laughs> uk but um, and i have a grandmother i'm here that is a grandmother um next to me <laughs> and it was the you know and they gave they gave me that but i that was the one i asked for because that was the one i wanted after you know i have played with all of those machines they're all amazing in different ways but my god yeah i'm with you the grandmother is like uh it's like the perfect expression of a vintage synth. It's like everything you want from a vintage synth that isn't necessarily what a vintage synth is capable of, depending on which vintage synth you pick. But like that, it, it you know, if you were doing a Stranger Things type, you know, scenario, you'd want a grandmother because it's just. If that was uh, something that you're able to track down in a pawn shop or a, like a, a vintage shop in 1996, how fanatic would you have been about that? Of course, you, of course you would. How much would it come on now? Exactly, because it's like for me, it's like okay, this is like you know before that, like I've had a lot of like different synths. It's like I had a Profit Five in the 90s. I sold to pay for computer music classes. I had a Moog multi Moog, which is like you know lots of power and stuff like that. But for me, the raw pow- like the raw sonic tone that I always gravitated towards was the Rogue, mm. which has almost no controls. You can't do much with it, but the tone coming out of it 
was amazing. And just like for all these decades, like wandering around, like, you know, moving up and down the West coast of the U S cause you know, San Francisco and Portland and Seattle and Olympia. It's like, that was the synth I always had with me that in the SH 101, but that's kind of broken now. So I'm sad about that. The grandmother, I'm like, okay, so this looks like a modular rogue, but it has better envelopes and it has a third oscillator that you can use. And it's like, well, that's cool. And then when I finally got it, I, was playing the grandmother. It's like the, no, the rogue goes in storage now. There's nothing I can't do in the rogue that I can't do with this. But this does so much more. You've you've just taken delivery of the Prophet Ten, I guess. How is that, dear Lord? <laughs> I okay. So here here's the thing. I owned a Prophet Five in the '90s and sold it to pay for computer music classes. Yes, P.S. I love that. By the way, you are the the ultimate living embodiment of the sort of death <laughs> of analog and <laughs> the rise of computer based music. You 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 sold it for computer lessons. Amazing. I did, and and then now it's like, and now I'm paying myself back with interest. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. I'm paying 1998 me. It's like thank you 1998 me because I I did miss that Profit Five, but the Profit Five it sounded good, but never had like. The sound of it never was as good as like the multi mode. Right. It didn't have that like rawness to the, you know, you could get bright and brassy, but you couldn't get that kind of subtle overdrive stuff that good Moogs have. Mm. This one does. You put it on the Rev 1 2 filter, and it's like I was A Bing it with my Moog Siren here. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I can get every sound out of the, you know, running one voice on the Prophet that I could out of the Siren. As far as like, you know, because the siren is like kind of like a good generic sounding, like, but like generic sounding, like older Moog type sound. You know what I mean? It's not less, not like a mini Moog, but it's like, you know, it's, it sounds more like a 70s Moog than like the sub 37 or something like that. It's like, you know, but it's a great sound, but it's like the only thing that the siren could do that this Prophet 5 or the Prophet 10 couldn't do on a single voice is like that particular really low Taurus thing. But the Prophet 10 was close enough. I just put a little bit of low EQ after it and it nailed it. Mm, amazing. It's got, so it's like, so it's like, it's got, it's a better polyphonic sounding. And like the, the Prophet 6 is good, but it doesn't sound like that. It isn't the sort of thing where it's just like, a, you know, because Prophets have more modulation capabilities than something like, you know, an OB8 or something like that. But, you know, but I, I'd have to do a lot of stuff on the Prophet 6 to make it sound the way I want. And this thing just sounds incredible the raw timbre of it is just amazing it's like it's up there with my mono synths i mean i don't think it's going to replace the grandmother but it's got that you know got the sort of sound that i've never gotten out of a polyphonic before yeah yeah that's and that's kind of the thing i think a lot of folks you know i've heard folks who bought poly synths and are like oh it doesn't do a very good bass it's like well you know did you buy it to be a bass synth i mean i know obviously if you've got lots of oscillators and you put unison on Hell, yes, obviously it can make a ludicrous huge sound, but it's not, you've already got another, you've got loads of synths and you've got loads of monosynths lying around. Like, did you buy it for this purpose? It's Exactly. But, but, but it's interesting to think about like these artists you'd see like around 1980, 1981. And it's like, you know, like think about Talking Heads on their 1980 tour where it's like they have three prophets on stage and that's it. Each, you know, each keyboardist has a prophet. Amazing. I, I really think it's like these, the Rev 1 2 architecture does a really good bass sound and it's programmable. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to use it for all my bass stuff I'm, or for everything, but it's just like, this is really a super capable synth. So well, you can see why they would use it back then when it's like, hell, I just push a button and it's making that sound immediately. Like, yeah, you didn't have to worry about like, I mean, like, and that's the thing, most synths back then probably sounded like that. It's probably harder to find a bad sounding synth. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, well, like, you know, like think about, oh, are you going to use a mini Moog or an Odyssey? It's like, they both sound great. They just sound different. Yeah. God, the analog revival revolution is just amazing to me. Well, the synth world is just when you think it couldn't get any more badass and then you see Korg leak the mini 2600 and you're just like, what, you know, we can have our cake and eat it in so many different ways. It is almost verging on ridiculous at this point i know i mean i'm like i like with this like prophet 10 it's like you know what i am done with synths i don't need anything more and i saw that i'm like um uh, it's like come on it's a 2600 it's like those like i've i've borrowed like a gray face 2600 in like 1997 and still think about it it's like yeah that thing just sounded so insane yeah and if it's got the speakers as well and if it 
and the spring reverb, which um, I cannot help but notice that our friends at Behringer didn't think that the spring reverb was very important to the 2600, which um, I will allow them to make that mistake. <laughs> Just like, like, come on. And that's the one thing. It's like Behringer actually, it's like, I remember hearing some of their pedals. are like, these algorithms are not ripped off from anyone. Yeah. Or they're not ripped off from anyone any more than any other reverb was ripped off from anything else. They have to code it from scratch. They can't reverse engine. They can't crack open a chip and pull out the code. Plus they own TC Electronics. Probably a few chefs in there that probably could help you design a reverb algorithm. They've, they've, they've got their legacy there, but yeah, but it's like versus like, you know, like, like that's what I love about like the grandma. I mean, like I'm obviously a super reverb snob and I love the reverb on the grandmother just because it's just that thing. It's like, I can sit there and like play it. It's like, okay, this is like, it's not a synthy, but it can, if I want, like, it's the closest I have. It's like, if you hear like the dark star soundtrack, yeah, it's like, it just has like, you know, just that, just those weird electronic things in spring reverb. It's just that sound. It's true. Like the uh, my first experience of that is actually on video. There's a video where I went to Adrian Utley's house, and he showed me his VCS3, and he just turned the the wet dry knob on it, and it's just like, and you can actually hear me just go, oh wow, just like, oh god. Even through the speakers of the 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 synthy, there's a certain uh, there's like a haunting. Uh, and it yeah i don't know it's not it isn't a room it, it but it it instantly makes you it gives you feelings it's organic there's something about it it's reacting with the sound it's this very organic strange sound there's like it's yeah it's haunting is the best way to put it and that's part of that haunting is because it is so metallic it no longer becomes metallic as a concern it's like it gives you some frequencies kind of related to whatever you're putting into it <laughs> It's like, you know, spring reverb, you know, we talk about like a, a, a room having tens of thousands of reson resonances in parallel. A plate has maybe 10,000 to 20,000 resonances. A concert hall has 4 billion, you know, like there's maybe several hundred in a spring. Oh, wow. And they're not going to be, and like odds that they're that close to what you're playing into it, eh, not that good. <laughs> So it's like, so you're just going to have, I mean, which is also like, you know, playing guitar through like, I've got this deluxe reverb reissue here and playing guitar through that spring reverb. It's like, it's the sort of thing where it's like, if you play it in one key and then you put a capo on and play it like a semitone up, it's going to sound totally different because of mm. just how the resonances are so much different. Oh, that's bonkers. I never really thought about that. I've never really experimented. I need to try it on the grandmother, just shifting octaves and seeing how the spring reacts. I mean, is it similar to the way a room, like a real room, like resonates? Is it that? Well, yeah, but so much, I mean, like, it's more like take, a, it's more like how a flawed room, like a room you haven't done a good room treatment to and how it reacts. That's what a spring reverb is like. A room, a, a spring reverb is basically like your shittiest untreated poorly like set up room it's just got weird things but then maybe if you play like this one note on a synth it sounds awesome yeah. one thing that's really fun is like to record stuff on the grandmother and then slow it down hmm. through the spring reverb so it's like and like you know like short notes like like i've done stuff where it's like played really fast sequences and slow them down by an octave or two and so that like makes the reverb longer and you can just hear it it's just like but it doesn't sound like a digital reverb getting longer because it's just so metallic and weird. Oh, that's a good thing. I need to try that. I have been multi-tracking it, but I've not. I've not pitch shifted like or you know slowed down the the results. Yeah, that's something because I do that in in live a lot. It's just like okay, take this track now, just like change the rate so it plays back slower, and like which is a way that they would have got you know the, the, pretty much one of the few ways they would have got big reverbs back in the day is to slow it down. As a matter of fact, like if, if I'm right, like they used to make like concert halls, they used to do like one tenth scale models of them and then pipe in, I think, argon, some gas that does that doesn't have the that doesn't have the high frequency absorption of our atmosphere. Cause it's like, you know, and then and then they would like play sounds in it, like, you know, obviously with high fidelity tape decks at, you know, at higher speeds and then slow it down so that they can kind of see what how it would react. 
This is how I think we're pioneering a like a Eurorack module. It's a tiny like version of sort of Abbey Road Studio uh, Two or whatever, you know, but filled with argons. <laughs> exactly, but, but like that's the whole thing. It's like take like the spring reverbs in your you know your system, like which reminds me, like <clears throat> I need to set my Eurorack stuff up again. I've got somewhere I've got a spring ray and several tanks for it. Yeah, and yeah. it's like yeah, like be able to just do taste tests of that, but like being able to record those and then slow them down and then. Or like, or using the sounds in a sampler with the spring reverb baked in. That that is a sound. I was going to say you could. Well, you could also couldn't. Surely you could just play the part at too high a pitch, and then pitch it down, and you've got the correct pitch with extended reverb. Exactly. That's what I mean. It's like you play like really high pitches, and then you, now meanwhile, meanwhile, like spring reverbs don't have a lot of high frequencies in the first place. So when you do that, it's going to be murk. But what's wrong with murk? Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the fun, right? Yeah. So we've talked a lot about reverbs. We haven't talked much about delay. Um, I think there's the question, uh, and I didn't. I don't think I pointedly asked you this, but what is your favorite hardware reverb, or could be software reverb? And what is your favorite hardware, or could be software delay? And it can't be one of your own. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Like um, I'll, I'll talk about like you know hardware. Like so. My hardware reverb holy grail is what I don't have here. I have a couple of lexicons. Like I have the 300 and like, a, like I guess I have a PCM70 somewhere. Like, you know, the ones that are commonly available. Certainly rented other reverbs while designing like vintage verb and like, you know, rented studio space when you couldn't just rent the unit. Yeah. And for me, the holy grail is the 224XL by lexicon. It has all the 224 algorithms in it running at a higher sampling rate. I'm not saying that's great, but they're running a higher sampling rate. But then it has algorithms that are like what ended up running on the 480L. But the 480L used a, a different sort of modulation. They used basically, you know, they talk about random hall. It's a more randomized modulation. It's not the, the chorusing stuff that you hear in the 224. The 224XL has four, early 480L type algorithms but with that chorusing pitch modulation. But not everything is chorusing pitch modulated. It's more like they put it at the front. And so you'd have this modulation, but then it also moves through cold spots where there is no modulation. And it's just like the, and the, the algorithm that just haunts me is rich plate on the 224XL because the size of it gets ludicrously big. Most rich plates on lexicon reverbs have a maximum size of 39 meters, where the size corresponds to the length of the delays used inside. The 224XL goes up to 80 meters. And when you do that, it's just the most beautiful. The sound just hangs there. It's just a glorious sound. And then otherwise, like realistic reverbs that I love. I love Fender Spring reverbs in the amps. I love the Grandmother reverb. I love, um, I think, like, I love... I love black hole in the in the eventide stuff. I love mm. on the Strymon pedals. I love on the big sky. I do love the bloom algorithm and clouds on the. Uh, I love the Flint '80s hall I talked about. Yeah. O- other plugins, I I don't know. There's a lot. I think that like a uh, little plate from Sound Toys did a great job. I think that in the more convolutiony but kind of algorithmic space. Uh, cinematic rooms from Liquid Sonics is really good. In the pure algorithmic space, uh, man, um, Michael Carnes just knocked it out of the park with his exponential audio stuff. He really brought this kind of like transparency into algorithmic reverbs, which is just amazing because I feel like he had to design, like he worked for decades at Lexicon, and I think he had to design algorithms that sounded like Lexicon's. And then when he like worked on his own, he's able to do things that have lexiconish characteristics, but improve on other things. So they're like more transparent if that's the thing that you're looking for. And I think it's really cool. As far as that transparent thing, I also think Fab Filters Pro R is really just incredible sounding. I think Relab, Michael or Martin Lind, Relab, his uh, Sonsig. I really think that sounds great, Sonsig A. And I think that's really cool because it's like the first one that I know of of his where it's like, I know he knows all these different like old reverb architectures, but this is the first one where I could tell is like, these are his algorithms. And it's just cool to see him like just moving into like his own space with that. Mm. Yeah, those are the pedals that really come to mind. So what about delay? The problem is, is that like, 
tape delays are totally awesome and totally suck because they're just these mechanical things. So it's like, you know, I would say the 201, yeah. but not but not my 201 as I look over and glare at it, which <laughs> literally like, you know, like use that all the time during the development of a hollow delay. And it came to a grinding halt, literally ground, like literally. just this grinding noise. It's like, so we had to like, <clears throat> the final tune-in is like, we're lucky that we have, we're borrowing a second one from someone else, you know, to be able to like tune like some, the, some of the final tunings and they sound close enough to each other. Like I love the 201 because it's not that well behaved. Like I have a 301 as well. The chorus one. Yeah. And the, the chorus sounds good, but like the modulation on that, it has some wow and a little bit of flutter. It's like, so it's kind of, and it's got a bigger frequency bandwidth, um, and it you know runs fine. Every two hundred one I've ever played with seems like it's it's like it's about to break. <laughs> like 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 there's something about it where it's like the the modulation you get is so much more random and cool, and that's because the tape mechanism for some reason is not nearly as sturdy as the three hundred one. And if you like if you hook it up, you can hear it's like. It's barely holding the tape in place. And then it's like every now and then, like they'll just grind, like stops. St- the tape gets stuck in there. And it, so it gives just the perfect amount of random row and flutter, not cyclical, but like random. And then, then the frequency balance of it is so nice because they roll off more of the low frequencies in the decay. So it gets that three, like that 201 sound when it feeds back. You know, it's just you recognize it instantly. So that the helps sound sort of feedback. Yeah, yeah. But but it's all it gets really thin and like and it also gets thinner the faster your tape speed is. So if like you've got like a really short delay and like you turn the speed up, you know, to its highest rate, so the shortest delay, it really is shrill and like and like it just oscillates in weird ways. And like the the tape splicing and all that, how it knocks things out of loop. And like I have several other tape delays like that. Like the 301 doesn't sound as cool. A Korg stage echo I have, it's cool, but it has like noise reduction in it. And when it hits the tape splice, it stops self-oscillating, which it turns out is just part of the physics of the noise reduction in it. Like when I made noise reduction model for Valhalla delay. It's like I have my splicing in there and it stops self-oscillating when it hit the splice. I'm like, yes, I hit the model. And now I have to take that splice out in that way because that sucks because I don't <laughs> want it to stop self-oscillating. Um, but having said that, I also, I love echoplexes. Yeah. I think I might like the sound of echoplexes a little bit more. Like, and it depends what it is. It's like, I have like an EP3 from the seventies and it's, so warbly and random it but in it like it's almost too much but it's not quite too much and then i have a full tone two tube tape echo and that one's like got this new tape and doesn't warble much at all and it still sounds amazing just like the way that hits the tape and the tubes in it so i love that one and then one thing i've been playing around with in the last couple of weeks i've got this univox echo chamber ec80a and that works on like some weird dictaphone tape cartridge and that one really barely works and there's so much noise in it it just it's ridiculous amounts of noise i put an example up on soundcloud because there's no way that people would believe that an echo could be that noisy (laughs) it's got it's got like so much flutter and like something like jitter it's called scrape flutter where it's like these higher frequency flutter things it just creates just like this anything that goes into it turns into like you're it's like you're using noise fm on a synth amazing it's beautiful <laughs> yeah. so I, I i love that but again that's one it's like when you turn it on it works sometimes yeah sometimes you have to wiggle it around the habit sometimes you just have to hit it a few times so uh, but, you know, like, so I love a lot of tape days, but really it's like that, you know, 201 Echoplexes and this Univox for its own just messed up nature. Bucket Brigades, I love this Ibanez rack mount, the AD150, because it has a bandwidth that changes as you change the delay time. As like, instead of just having, like, most Bucket Brigades are really dark because they have to have an anti-aliasing filter for the slowest clock. So they just have a fixed one. Yeah. This one and this other boss delay I have have a clock that tracks or has a filters that track the clock. So it's like the shorter it is, the brighter it gets. I don't know why more Bucket Brigade stuff doesn't do it. Probably because it's expensive, mm. but it just sounds brilliant. And then I also love a memory man. Memory mans are great. Yeah. B- boss DM2. Like you get one of those shortest delay time, 
turn up the feedback the whole way and you start turning down the delay time. It's just like that breakdown sound from setting sun. Just that like, it's just like, that's it. That's the sound right there. So I, I love, I, I love those hardware delays, software delays. I, I'd say it's less about like what I love so much as more like what I respect, you know, Echo Boy, you know, Sound Toys Echo Boy, you just, that's the standard out there in like in studios. Basically, it's like, how do you design a delay that works when everyone working in the space already owns Echo Boy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know, and then like other things, it's like, I really love the the thought that went into the, not the first replica, but the, the newer replica from uh, Native Instruments. What's it's getting replica X something? I should know this. Uh, I haven't tried that. Uh, XT replica, rep, replica XT. Yeah, I really like the thought that goes into that delay. It's just like you know, like they thought about a lot of things. It's like it's different choices that I would make, but yeah. it's really good. Oh, I should also say it's like choices wise. I think that um, Echo Boy Junior from from Sound Toys is brilliant because it's like it's they take away a lot of the options of echo boy and just kind of make it quicker to use so that was a big like just knowing that that existed that was a big influence when i was working on valhalla delay not like replicating that in any way but just like that's you know i like the choices they made there yeah i I actually i own echo boy and i don't use it I, i basically have never used it i've got an nfr of it but echo boy i would use because of that exact thing. There's too many controls on Echo Boy, which is stupid for me. I'm just being lazy, but it, it, it boils down to, I want a quick result. And I, you come to learn like your delay. I have rapidly come to sort of learn like, I'm like, this sounds great. And it's, but usually doing stereo, it's like, I, um, I want it to do like huge, wide, beautiful stereo things, which it does superbly. I, th- I think I think the thing about Echo Boy, like my only complaint about it is I think it's ubiquitousness is like, I think like when people talk about, oh, I want a tape delay sound, I think far more people have worked with Echo Boy's tape models than have ever worked with a physical tape delay. Yeah. So I think, and I think in general, that's something that's like, when people talk about, oh, this doesn't sound like a tape echo, it's like, do you own a tape echo? It's like, if you own a tape echo, you'll know. I mean, of course, you'll never duplicate your tape echo. Yeah. You can't. Every tape echo sounds different because of the, of the you know, how that particular tape is damaged and how it's been adjusted. I've, I've played with tape echoes like that sound nothing like each other. And it's the same physical device. Just I've played it, you know, over a couple of years where it went into the shop. It came out sounding totally different. But so I think like, yeah, plugin wise, like those are the ones like, you know, Echo Boy, Echo Boy Jr. and uh, Replica XT are the delays that I really know about. Do you have any of the sort of like big hardcore, like do you have a H3000 and sort of any of that, you know, like the kind of big hardware rack delays? Uh, I have an H3000. I just, I think of the H3000 more for the pitch shifting stuff, the micro pitch, which is, it can do so much more than that, but that's. You know, when you're developing a com- commercial product, you just realize that so many people that have an H3000 pick a micro pitch preset and just keep it on there. Even though it's like, you know, you can do, it's got all sorts of capabilities. And it's like the reverbs on the H3000, I, as I say, I should acknowledge, they sound great. They're so simple. The swept reverb algorithm is really amazing. It's like, even though it's like, it's so sparse and stuff, it still sounds great. But I don't, I mean, these are things like I don't, I tend not to turn on those rack stuff much unless I'm tuning in stuff on my own. It's like, okay, I need to have, I need to have some micro pitch in here. What ones do they use? Absolutely no escaping the plugin. It's ubiquity and convenience. <laughs> yeah. Pull it up, it works. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's and it's controllable. I think that you're absolutely right. There's, there's certainly plenty of mayhem available in plugins should you want to have it. But there is absolutely no question that, that, a, trying to make music with a delay that is not just naturally clocked to the tempo of your session and, and just does, doesn't decide to just break halfway. I mean, I've got a, like an analog mixing desk that just part on the number of the channels, they are not centered when they are centered <laughs> on the, you know, and it's, those things are not cool. Those are not cool, fun things to have to deal with when you want to make music. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had like an old like Mackie 1202 and I used to love to overdrive the preamps of it. And then it just started making a sound. And it's like, well, that sound I can't work with. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know. I don't want to get this repaired. It's not worth repairing an old 1202 at this point in time. 
but but for me it's like i think it's like as far as things that like i think that in general like yeah like the big digital rack mount stuff once i've done a model to where i want it to sound i tend not to you know even if it's influenced by some of that digital stuff i tend not to mess with the hardware anymore because like well look it's in the box i tend to work with analog synths because it's like I just like, there's something about the models that doesn't quite suit me. And I'm not necessarily even being fair to the models. I know that like, I never know how to pronounce Urz's company. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, U R S. Is it, is it Uhi? Oh, Yuhi, Yuhi. <laughs> Yuhi, Yuhi. Okay. Yuhi. I would say, I say Yuhi. I, and I just got, Urz just sent me his um, civilization module and I asked for could I please have an NFR of Diva, uh, which, he did, <laughs> which he gave to me, which I'm extremely grateful, and also the Repro, uh, which, and um, I don't know if this is what you were going to say, but I must say Diva does sound brilliant. Like, it sounds really good. <laughs> and, and and that's the sort of thing, I mean, like, you know, like, I mean, there's a thing, like, I like working with analog synths, and I do think that, like, a good analog mono synth, it's like, look, to me, I can do stuff with it where it's going to sound better than the software realizations. Polysense, it's like, I feel like this Prophet 10 is definitely one that's like, okay, this is stuff sound wise. It probably sounds better than, you know, a virtual analog plugin. I think part of that is more like, you know, a lot of these polysense just don't sound as, the hardware ones don't sound as good as the, the monosynths traditionally have. Cause it's like, you know, the changes you have to do to make them programmable, put VCAs everywhere and all that. It's like you might be getting a better sound from Diva or, I mean, my God, I worked with Live all the time. Andrew Simper's filters in Live, my, they sound so good. Like yeah. I've, I've created some like sounds. Auto that, filter or like, the, which do you mean? They're all over the place. His filters are in everything in there now. They're in Wavetable. They're in the sampler. They're, they have like his filters you can choose while using FM and Operator. Yeah. You know, it's like, so like I've created sound, like grab the output of the mixer on the matriarch, just four waveforms, but just the out, you know, just the mixer directly out, send it to the VCA, you know, so I've got a good, you know, goes to my output jack and then bring that into sampler. And you've got this four oscillator monosynth and you choose what filters you want. Do you want his MS-20 model? Yeah. Do you want his Oberheim model, including the sort of like, you know, variable notch sort of stuff that you see on the OB6. Do you want his Moog model, which is, you know, it's based on a prodigy, not the best Moog filter, but considering that it's sitting there on the same machine that I do my email on, it's stunning. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then it's like, and then you put whatever waveforms in. It's like, you know, like, so there's so much amazing stuff with regards to that in the computer. So it's strange that I'm sitting here and like have, several analog synths around me it's and it's it's partly obviously it's the user experience it's it's just because you have all of those controls available to you in a plug-in does not mean that you wish to spend the same amount of time as you would if you have the real physical thing there's a, there's an immediacy to being able to just quick and turn and and there is unfortunately until until, um, you know, our computers are full 10 finger multi-touch because they're all, you know, grand iPads, then it won't be this. It's just not the same as interacting. But I would, I would say, and actually I had a very interesting eye-opening experience recently where I, for the first time ever, was able to directly compare a clone of something, a synth, to a synth that I own and know very well and have owned for more than 10, 12 years. And it's yeah. never was my eye more open to the fact that a person who owns a computer and has access to something like Diva or like the V collection, you know, Arturius plugins, you've, you've, as far as I'm concerned, you really do for 95 to 97% of all intents and purposes, you have those machines now because that's how close they actually are. You know, I think, and 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 whilst of course we just said like usability is the factor and it's it's it is different if it's you don't have the physical object you know if we're just talking about the sound like it's really close it's shocking how close it is it also illustrates how synths are different because my Juno six sixty its filter is 
weird and it, 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 it quivers and it warbles a lot more than the model does. And then I put that to them. I was like, Hey, you've got it wrong. Mine's quivering and warbling. And they're like, dude, your one is really wonky. Ours doesn't do this. Do you know what I mean? They've got one there. Of course. Here, here's the thing though. It's like for me like that, it all depends what sort of quivering and warbling you're talking about. For me, like I owned a Juno 60. At one point, everyone in Seattle I knew owned a Juno 60. It was just like, I don't know what happened around here, but like literally I was like in a band with like four people and each of us had a Juno 60. Like talking heads. But. Oh, yeah, but with a ch- much cheaper synth at the yeah, time. Yeah, lower rent. Yeah, yeah. It's like profits, profits fives were still like, you know, I bought mine for $800 at the time. With a Juno 60, I bought for 250 and then I and then I broke it and I sold it for 70. That was like that's cuz like I was like I'd found a a Univibe for 10 bucks. Wow. And was but it was it didn't have a pedal with it so I was like playing with it and then I like I got the case in contact with the transformer in the Univibe and that just sent an electric jolt into the Juno 60. Oh, and so nice. it's just stuck in a preset. So it's like okay, like it's not working and so I just, after a couple of years, just having it's like, screw it. So I put it on the market, sold for 70 bucks to a guy that drove down from Vancouver, BC, three hours. He comes down, plugs it in, and it's working fine. I'm like, well, you just got yourself an amazing deal. <laughs> God damn. But, but it ended up kind of like breaking later on too. So it's like, you know, there was some damage to it. But but the thing is, is like, for me, it's like, you know, I have a Juno 6, had a Juno 60 and had an SH-101. They use the same filter chip. To me, those filters sound totally different. And yeah, there's something do. about like the resonance of the SH-101 that as you get like close to the frequency of the note that you have, that resonance starts jumping around in the SH-101. Mm-hmm. And the Juno never did that. And it turns out that the only difference in the filters is that the Juno 60 has a very like, it's feedback path, very smooth. Like there's no... It just kind of like takes the the resonance path, just takes the output of it, goes through VCA for resonance and goes back into the input. The SH-101 has these diodes going back to back to ground that clips the resonance. What that does is that that keeps the resonance from getting too high of amplitude Yeah, because it kind of limits how big it gets. But it also does stuff where I think it also kind of limits the base cut of the filter. And it causes that jumping around of the resonance frequency because it comes this nonlinear system. So for me, that little kind of like jumping around thing, it could be that maybe you just got a bad control voltage, or it mm. could be that that's just some physical thing that happens in a real analog filter that they haven't modeled successfully. Yeah. Well, the, the virtual version does have some of that quiver, but it's, I think it's, I, I, I it could be other factors. Like for example, that my Juno, has the Tubatech Juno 66 mod. So there is technically more stuff strapped to the, uh, you know, well, more things in control of the filter as far as I know. Oh, aware. okay. So that it could be also it. be a symptom of that. Uh, how do you like that, by the way? What I like, I like it. Well, obviously it adds MIDI, which is useful, but the the significant thing that it contributes, which transforms the synth, is detune. The detuning of the Juno 60 that it, it adds is just wonderful and and it transforms the sound of the Juno from this very pristine into this spooky woozy world which is something you've never heard it do yeah well yeah because like i remember like hitting the unison button on the Juno 60 is like yeah why do i do that it's not a good sound it's just like you know stock Juno 60 is just like you know it's just this very everything's locked into the same frequency it just doesn't sound good but having detune in there can make it really beautiful so that's yeah. interesting yeah, it is. It is like it. It gives it that kind of apexy sort of. You know, a lot of his kind of micro tuned or like intentionally mildly detuned sounds. You know, and I know that that you you he Diva has like you can detune each virtual oscillator as well. You know, I think you can do it on Repro as well. It might be Repro I'm thinking of, but you know, he's putting in stuff where he can allow you to just wonk the model very in interesting subtle ways and and, and spook up the sound. The, the the vintage knob on the Prophet 10 does a really nice job of it. And one of the things I love about it is it does a little bit of the detuning. Yeah. But what it really does is that it changes the envelope decay and release times so that not all the envelopes 
have this you know, like it's modeling what you what you'd find on like these old envelope generators where it's like okay because it's like you know it it would have been something where it's like you know if you had inaccurate resistors or capacitors for you know like you'd be off by a certain percentage and a percentage a couple of percent difference in like a, a fast attack let's say you're like 10 percent, you know or let's say you're 20 percent off what's the difference between like 10 milliseconds versus like 12 milliseconds you can't really hear it but when you have the difference in the envelope decays and releases and you have long ones you'd have much different release times and so for unison you know you you turn that up and like these instead of having like if you a unison patch instead of having all the filters go down the exact same rate they get spread out over time it's a beautiful i mean like basically it's like you turn on it's like okay that's to get really nerdy, the the sound at the beginning of Tom Sawyer, you can just nail now, if that's something you want to do. <laughs> I'm not saying you need to do that. It's, it's yeah, like exactly. yay, <laughs> but I can do rush covers now. But it's still it's, it's really cool and just like yeah, like the thing is like the imperfections, and people have to model those in there. I mean that's the big yeah. thing with the digital is like they aren't in there. You have to put them in there. But sometimes they come up like, and that's the thing with filters. If you model it right, the imperfections are in there and they're not necessarily like, you don't have to say, oh, now I want to wiggle around this resonance frequency. It's like, no, it's just the model itself will just do that automatically, which is yeah, so cool. If you get it right. So moving to the, I have a sort of uh, final question, which is the future of music technology. Um, and it doesn't mean like, what are your future products necessarily? Or that could be, that could be a factor, but um it's a, a bit of an open question. What do you see as the future of music technology? I think it's really less about the technology itself than what sort of workflows people like. Like, I mean, I think that people anticipated that computers would get more and more powerful. I don't know if anyone anticipated that that modular synthesis would come back and that like people would want to have modules that essentially have little computers inside of them. So it's, it's more about like, I don't know what it's going to be because we don't know what sort of things people are going to resonate with in the future. Like, I'm surprised that pedals are still a thing, but they really are. People love pedals, even though, look, you can do all that in your computer, but it's, it's more about like what technology allows and how sick people get of technology. Like what you you want to get something real? You want to make a Yaz record? It's like you want to like yeah. throw, <laughs> it's like it's like you know people want to like throw out all their guitars and get synths. It's like you know like just like it all depends what those cultural things are. I mean, I'm very happy and lucky, knock on wood, that reverb came back. I you know it's like which and did it's it like, ever I go away? Did it? Would you say would... it got drier in popular music? It's so weird to hear records I used to think were dry. And now it's like, you know, I listened to him. It was like, you know, like Rick Rubin productions. Like they're so dry. And I just hear all this reverb on the drums. Like that's not dry. The vocals are dry, but the thing overall, like there's a lot of reverb on this. It's like, it's not like seventies level of dry, but yeah, I don't think reverb ever really went away, but, but you never know what sort of like techno, like what people are going to want. I mean, it's like, I still don't know if we know the impact of what everyone being shut in is going to be doing to music. Like what is it like what concerts are going to be like when they happen again, what people expect to see at that, like how is like been seeing stuff over video or zoom going to impact stuff. So I don't know, like technology wise, I see it from more of a cultural perspective from a technological perspective. I think that models stuff is getting more, more and more accurate. And I think like at some point we might just reach saturation of accuracy. And then it's like, are people going to start working on technologies that aren't models? Like there's so much stuff that it's interesting to see granular stuff is finally coming to the, to the forefront. But I've been reading about granular in like computer music journal since the late eighties. Yeah, I was going to say, these are not new concepts. Although I'm seeing, I do, I see that the new Ableton, like live 11 has got loads of spectral, you know, spectral effects in it. Oh, that's cool. But, but then part of it is like, I hear granular and I hear like the artifacts of granular and it's just like, okay, like there's just so many like little high frequency clicks and stuff like that. And it's like, I think it's like, would be interesting if people start doing more imagined realities, like kind of like, I, I think that's why I love the grandmother so much. The grandmother, I think, was the most amazing thing because it was like the grandmother, I think, came out of, and they mainly talk about this book. This book hasn't shown up for, yet for me, but like, I'm pretty sure the grandmother started with them 
doing those ridiculously expensive reissues of the Moog modular stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, because it is the same. It's the circuits, but SMD versions of them. But they had to relearn what was in those. And I don't think like Bob Moog was a genius, but I don't think like trying to figure out why his flawed circuits sounded the way they did was never his thing. He always wanted stuff. He had things that he thought were flawed and wanted to fix them. You know, like that's why like the, you know, the Voyager and the little fatty where it's like, I think that when Moog went back and like kind of really researched the past and it's like, here's the past, but then turn around and like figured out how to do that in surface mount that could be made much cheaper and smaller. So it's like learning from the past, but then kind of creating like, um, kind of like, like alternative reality type thing. What, what do you call that sort of fiction where it's like, what would happen if like the Nazis were still around and like, you know, in Britain today, like that mm. sort of thing. Yeah, what do you exactly. call it? Spe- like that, that's that kind of alternative reality. Fiction. I was going to say fan fiction, but no, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of that. But the grandmother is something like that where it's like, okay, this is something where you're really basing it on old technology, but instead of recreating that, you're doing something new. And I think it'd be interesting is like, can you do this in the digital space? It's like, like, is there such a thing as like, could someone create an analog granulator? Where it's not really an analog granulator. You don't have like, you know, dozens of tape heads flying on and off of a tape deck. But what would it sound like if you did that? What would happen if you started modeling things where it's like, you kind of like start tuning in the artifacts of these things. Just like we're really obsessing about analog artifacts, but that's just one sort of artifact. What happens if people start really thinking about other artifacts as like, look, this is something that you can play around with. We have the technology now. You don't have to just accept this artifact. What if you tune it in the way that you want? Uh, that, that's that's an idea for me because, I mean, that's one of those things like, for example, in Valhalla Shimmer, like I was really influenced in Valhalla Shimmer looking at like, you know, the Shimmer stuff done on the 80s records like by Eno and stuff. Yeah. And he used a, a like the, the pitch shifting they used was an AMX pitch shifter. Which is really like it's a very interesting thing. It's is that pitch shifter only has a single read head, and it so it doesn't crossfade. It just jumps to the right location, and it has this like auto correlation to determine what the right jumping location is, which is really clever. Especially if you have like a voice going through it. If you have like a broadband single that that like it's auto correlation, but but if you put that feedback of a reverb, a reverb is decorrelating which is the exact opposite of what you want to find a good splicing point. So it basically finds this random splicing point each time. So for Shimmer, just like, well, just choose a random splicing point. You're not going to succeed, so might as well just skip to where you're going. It's really cheap. <laughs> CPU-wise, it costs nothing to do that. It's just like, yeah, just randomize it. And it sounds really good, and it gets the sour sound out of the Shimmer. But I just feel like there's a world of like, artifacts like that out there that people can start like tuning it in it's like instead of the technically best solution what if you tune in like not technically best but it sounds awesome but come up with imagined ways of doing it like you know like like spli- digital splicing points sound like clicks analog splicing points sound like thunks how do you thunk this stuff how do you get things that sound like you know more like or just like get like just play around with that aspect of it it's like Instead of coming up with like throwing all the cycles at it so it's perfect, what if you figure out ways of making these things imperfect in a way that's new? Nice. Thanks very much. Goodness gracious, Gravy and Whiskers, that chap knows a lot about reverb. And I, for one, salute him. Sean, thank you so much for taking the time to um, attempt to <laughs> tell me what an all-pass delay is. A, a device or a concept that I'm afraid to say I'm absolutely no clearer on uh, from having spoken to you, which is no shade thrown on your ability to explain it, but my ability to understand. Uh, there is obviously a lot of incredible <laughs> knowledge and stuff that was blazed through. Um, my goodness, I you know, it's kind of... It's like having a whole sort of, well, chamber, world thrown open in front of you. And you can see the, I mean, the level of knowledge and sort of research required to do these things is just, it's extraordinary. And also, but 
it's not about this is kind of like the takeaway i actually wrote this down when i was editing this podcast um two bits but really the the main takeaway for me if you have twice the cpu and do something twice as complicated it doesn't necessarily sound twice as good that i believe is probably the most profound thing that's been that was stated because it's the chefs it's the chef it's not the food or the ingredients although of course you do need ingredients to cook a meal but a good chef can make great meals from simple basic ingredients and know what to do with them and so it's it's the fact that the future of um technology what was his exact wording oh it was uh how do you thunk this stuff (laughs) as in how do you make it thunk in interesting ways what are the artifacts that the human ear will find the most interesting and that a very, very sharp ear will know that that is the thing that needs to be zeroed in on and enhanced. Um, and it may well not be a CPU intensive process to do so. It's, it's, a, it's the ear, it's the human that says that's valuable and that's interesting and that's what people are going to be excited about or want to be creative with. Although with that said, the sort of history of electronic music is littered with legendary pieces of equipment where I was listening to uh, the Hanging With Audio Files podcast where Mr. Dave Rossum was talking about the fact that, you know, all of the things that people gravitated to in his machines were all of the faults. It was the low sampling rate that people loved most, which was the thing he was trying to get around, you know, and so it's that idea. But the point is, it's not about DSP and it's really easy to get blinded by, you know, increases in, in CPU technology, especially since we've just had like these M1 Max that we were talking about, which do seem to apparently have like a generational leap in power. And it may well be good for certain things, but for a lot of what is really important about what will sound good, it is not clearly going to necessarily be about DSP. It's more about, you know, do people... Do people know how to make great sounding things? And also, do they share things like what he was saying about the fact that a lot of these reverb secrets were hidden and they were hidden for the best part of 10 years. And that probably slowed down the development of reverb in general because people weren't able to build on the shoulders of giants because they were still trying to work out, you know, what so-and-so people had gotten right in the, you know, in the Lexicon 224. So it's really interesting. What an interesting sort of thing. And then also just that very, the very alchemistic and modular nature of it. How fascinating these kind of interconnected spiders webs. And if you're um, interested in hearing even more about reverb, pat on the back, by the way. Extreme pats on your back. I think you're one of us. I have two really good links for you. There is another talk that Sean has done, um, which is just generally about, you know, reverb, history of reverb, and and just Sean just uh, with a bit, maybe a bit more structure in the sense that it's a, you know, delivered talk, just talking about his passion. So watch that talk. It's really good. And then the other one is there's a talk by Tom Erb, who I mentioned. And Tom Erb is the DSP designer who works a lot with Make Noise, He's also an academic and a lovely man. And Tom is, he. I've got a talk which actually is on my channel, although I did not film where I was allowed to re-host because ironically, I needed to clear up the audio and remove a lot of reverb for it to sound good. And I was able to re-host it. Um, and basically it's Tom talking about the creation of the herb verb, uh, which is a modeless uh, reverb for modulars. And it, I think sounds amazing. It's very unique. If you want to watch Tom Erb talk about partly the history of reverb, reverb design structures with stuff on the screen and also how he designed the Erb verb, you may find that very interesting. I will also link to that below. And the other things that I'm going to need you to do, my friend, is if you haven't bought a Valhalla plugin and you make music on a computer, may I just help you out here and suggest that you go to ValhallaDSP.com and buy a few of his plugins. And if you don't even feel like buying them, there are free ones. As we mentioned, go and get Space Modulator, which is ostensibly a flanger, and go and get Supermassive, which is a supermassive reverb with lots of different modes. Both of these are free. They are free. They are absolutely stormingly good plugins and could be sold for very, very serious amounts of money 
should he be, be inclined to do so. But, you know, as he explained, he has his reasons for just giving things away. Um, and, it, you know, he found the whole process of doing Supermassive helpful um, during lockdown. Get them. They are stunningly good. I highly recommend Space Motivator as well. It's like one of my favourite sort of... It's a flanger, but it's just for chorusing, stereoising things. Just sounds awesome. And you can do like wonderful, weird, zinny sort of insane things. And then if you want to throw some money at it, just buy them all. I have literally bought every Valhalla plugin with my own money, no discounts. Um, I would thoroughly recommend that you get Valhalla Delay, which is his delay for stereo gorgeousness, a delay that can basically sound like everything, like a tape echo, a BBD, really old school, like gritty digital, and then also clean delays. It can do pitch shifting as well. It has lots of other clever modes and new stuff. And he added a bunch of um, presets following our conversation. Um, And so yeah, just buy Valhalla Delay. It sounds, it just sounds gorgeous. Uh, I was going to swear there. I won't swear. I'll keep it classy. It just sounds really good. Valhalla Delay is the best sounding delay that I own. And then the other one is Vintage Verb, um, which is like all the classic digital reverbs from the 70s and 80s. Him basically doing his take on these, these uh, classic sort of modes and machines. Uh, so it's kind of, reverse you know inferring and trying to reverse engineer these amazing modes which are very famous like non-lin and stuff like you know these things which were yeah just very successful and that's also a reverb that can sound very clean but it's got like these 70s gritty modes as well just really good like you've just for 50 dollars each you just don't have an excuse just buy buy his stuff it's great i bought it all and then finally it remains for me to both thank Signal Sounds for your hardware needs. If you want some hardware wetness, get yourself to signalsounds.com and wetten your whistle with some reverberous boxes. And also to thank Skillshare. Click the link in my description if you would like to do some learning. Skillshare is a great place. And lastly, something which I've never mentioned on this podcast, and I really need to start mentioning is Patreon, which is the beautiful service where you can offer a tip to your dear um, host and creator of this podcast, me, (laughs) which of course we are ad supported on the podcast uh, variously, but Patreon is just genuinely the way that I am able to continue making both the videos and the podcast in a meaningful way, uh, because unfortunately this is just too infrequent to make enough money to pay for (laughs) more than a few basics. Um, And so I would really appreciate if you can head to patreon.com forward slash Mylar Melodies. And if you would like to get stuck in, A, it helps me make these things. And B, there is also a community of wonderful people on Discord. You get to join the Discord community and chat to other users. People are very experienced um, and people who are new to these these things as well. People just starting out doing modular. So, you know, if you're kind of early in that game, it's really nice to have a community of people that can come in and help you and offer tips and um, and I'm on there as well, obviously floating around and chatting. And so, yes, Discord is just a really nice thing to be able to sort of get stuck into. And it's a benefit of supporting on Patreon. So patreon.com slash Melodies. That would be wonderful. And so, in the words of Richard D. James, thank you for your attention. Bye. Bye.